Okay, um, so I'm also gonna uh, talk about verifying distributed systems, but we're not gonna talk about all these uh, crazy partitions and failures, but we're gonna assume a simpler model, and but we're gonna pursue a much more automated approach, okay? So, so writing these kind of systems is, is pretty stressful, and um, often it goes a bit like this, so um, you write some code and then some um, random, you run it for a while and then some random bug appears and you try to debug it but like it only occurs on 10% uh, of the runs and you, you can't really trace it down <clears throat> but then you um, move on and write some more code and eventually it's gone but you don't know, really know why and um, you're left hoping that it um, won't turn up again um, but you're somewhat none the wiser okay so Ideally, we would make this process uh, somewhat easier. And we would like to help you, help you um, catch the bugs while you're actually writing the program. And want, you, ideally, you would just like remove the bugs one after the other, and if you're done, there are no more left, okay? And uh, this is kind of how it would look like. So you're writing your program, and you have this little check button, and if you click it, um, then it's gonna, gonna tell you uh, all sorts of things that are wrong with your program, for example, you have here um, an unmatched uh, receive and a send that goes off into nowhere. And then when you inspect the code, um, so you see that actually here you, you made a mistake and you were sending out a return address for the other process to reply to, um, but you didn't send your own address but somebody else's. Okay. So then when you fix it, <clears throat> you click the check button again and you actually get a proof um, that no deadlocks occur, and you can be sure that for the rest of the uh, uh, runtime of your systems, these bugs are not going to show up. Okay. So um, in this work, I'm going to present uh, an automated method uh, for doing this, uh, uh, for solving this problem, and uh, it proves the absence of deadlocks. Um, it gives you these kind of counterexamples. Um, it's fast enough um, to to be used uh, in an interactive use, as I just showed you. And it does have a restricted computation model, but um, it's, exp uh, it's expressive enough to uh, implement a bunch of algorithms, like uh, um, including a distributed file system and a MapReduce framework. Okay. Okay. So um, let me start off with an example of the kind of algorithm you want to verify. This is a simple two-phase commit, where you have a coordinator node and a bunch of network nodes. And the coordinator wants to uh, commit a transaction to all the network. And so um, the way it goes, um, it's um, split into two phases. In the first phase, the coordinator uh, sends out uh, a transaction data. And depending on the transaction, the, the nodes either decide uh, to commit um, or abort the transaction. Then they uh, send back uh, a vote. And uh, the coordinator uh, decides either to go ahead or uh, abort. Um, then uh, they, they, the coordinator sends out uh, the decision, um, everybody carries out uh, what, what was agreed on, and then uh, um, the network nodes uh, send an acknowledgement. Okay. So how will we go about uh, verifying this kind of uh, protocol? So in particular, we want to check that the sends and uh, receives match, which implies that there's going to be no dead loss. Okay. Um, so, um, there, there are two problems uh, with these kind of programs, and the first one is that they're highly asynchronous. So um, the messages travel at different speeds across the network, and uh, the processes execute at different speeds, which means that you get a large number of interleavings, and if you have races, um, different schedules might trigger different behaviors. Okay. So the second, the second thing that makes it hard to verify these uh, sort of protocols is uh, that you don't know how many nodes uh, the protocol is going to run with uh, when you actually execute it. So for any number of nodes, the protocol needs to be correct. So how would you go about uh, verifying this protocol? Well, we could test, but uh, then we don't get the guarantees that once we uh, removed all the counter examples, we, uh, we're done. Uh, we could try to write proof, but um, that's not what we're pursuing here. So we're looking for a kind of a push button automated uh, kind of approach. So. Uh, the most promising uh, candidate seems model checking, 
But um, firstly, you suffer from the state-based uh, state explosion. And secondly, you have an uh, infinite number of assistants that you will need to check. Um, so in the end, you can get the guarantees you want. Okay. So here's the key idea behind the message, uh, behind our method. So um, often, uh, when programmers uh, write sort of code, they don't reason about all these different case splits uh, in the execution. But what they have in mind is a simpler, um, single uh, rep representative uh, execution of the system. So uh, instead of reasoning a system about a system where um, you send out all the messages and then they, uh, then they arrive in some order, you, you actually reason about a system where first uh, the message is sent, then it's directly received, then the next message is sent, and it's directly received, and so on. Okay. And we call this uh, simple representative execution the uh, canonical sequencialization of the program. Okay, uh, so here's an example for two-phase commit. So in the canonical sequentialization, um, um, the coordinator sends out one after the other uh, the transaction it wants to commit. Then uh, the nodes, one after the other, uh, send their votes. Then one after the other coordinator uh, relays its decision. And then one after the other, everybody sends their acknowledgments. And I think this is actually the way you would uh, communicate this protocol to someone. So this is actually what you think about when you write it. Okay. Um, here's a slightly more uh, tricky example. This is a work stealing queue where you have a bunch of workers perform a task. And you have a queue that uh, assigns work items. And you have a coordinator that collects the results. So um, the way the system executes is uh, that the workers ask for a work item. And then the queue uh, answers back with a message. Uh, assigning a, a, an item of work, then uh, they compute the result and send the result to the coordinator. Okay. So here's uh, how the canonical sequentialization of this looks. So first, um, for each work uh, item, the queue assigns uh, the task to an arbitrary worker, who then computes the result and stores the result somewhere in, say, in a set. And then this is done for for all of the work items. And then an arbitrary in the second phase, an arbitrary worker uh, picks the result from the set and uh, sends it to the master. Okay. <clears throat> so how can we use uh, this insight that there are canonical sequentializations to verify uh, programs? Well, to verify if the program is correct, we can uh, compute the sequentialization. And if not, then likely the program is not doing really th what you thought it was. And if we find a sequentialization, then uh, we get some, a number of benefits out of it. So firstly, um, um, we get deadlock freedom. Um, secondly, we get an artifact, uh, maybe that sequentialization, which you can use to verify uh, further properties about your program. <clears throat> and uh, it's much simpler to, ver to verify them on the sequentialization because it's a much simpler program. Okay. <clears throat> so how would we actually go about uh, computing this uh, sequentializations? So the key idea is uh, to restrict the uh, things that you can compute. So what we do is we say, uh, we make sure that your program only contains races that yield uh, equivalent outcomes. And uh, we call this uh, condition symmetric non determinism <clears throat> Okay, let me show you how it works for the uh, first round of the two-phase commit protocol. So we want that races only produce equivalent outcomes. So in the first uh, round, the coordinator sends out the transaction it wants to commit, but there's only one, uh, one phase that can be received, so there's no race and uh, Vacuously, this holds. Um, the more interesting one is the route uh, is the round where everybody replies uh, and sends out their vote. So um, we have we have a race, but the question is, uh, do they all yield the same outcome? And so what we what we can notice is um, that all of the processes are symmetric. So symmetry always means invariance under transformation. So um, if you look at a, a round table from above and you spin it uh, in some angle, it still looks the same. And that's why I call it I say it's symmetric. But um, if you spin that one for, for some angle, it might not look the same. Okay. So in distributed systems, um, uh, symmetry means that if you can uh, permute the process identifiers, um, and it will yield an uh, equivalent halting state. Okay. Um, so if you name the processes here, and then you just promote the identifiers, then you end up in the same state. Okay, so how does this help us? So we have this race, 
and say we just uh, look at the, at the race between n1 and n2. So um, if we pick n1, do we cut any corners and uh, miss any uh, halting states? Well, we're going to end up in a state where we have this commit me message stored and the uh, process identifier. <clears throat> um, but what happens if we pick n2 instead? So if we pick n2, we end up in this state. But <clears throat> since the system is symmetric, we can uh, apply a permutation to end up in the first state. So in fact, uh, they have equivalent behavior. Okay. So how can we how can we use this to compute sequentializations? Um, so let's look again at uh, two-phase commit at the at the first message that's being sent out, and the coordinator uh, sends its transaction. There's no race, and what that means that is that we can directly schedule the message after it's being sent. And this is an application of Lipton's theory of need. <clears throat> okay, here's the second uh, example. So uh, the coordinators send out their uh, vote, and we have the race, but we know that the processes are symmetric, so we can just pick any of them and schedule it first. So again, we can use that to uh, uh, sequentialize the, the, the protocol. Okay. So we've implemented these insights in a, a rewriting method that uh, takes a concurrent program and rewrites it into a sequential version. So um, here's an example. So you have a process P, which uh, sends out a ping message to process Q, and then waits for a, another message and assigns it to some variable W. And it's um, composed in parallel with a process Q that waits for a message and then sends a Pong reply. Okay. So how can we uh, rewrite this into a sequential version? Well, we can just look at the first two messages first. So there's only one place in which uh, it can be received. So we can turn it into an assignment. And the same for the second one. So uh, here's a slightly more uh, complicated example. So process P executes a loop um, in which uh, it loops over a, a set of processes queues uh, that all run the same code. And in each, uh, in each iteration of the loop, um, they, it sends out a ping a message and waits for a reply. And the process <coughs> is going to wait for a uh, message and send out a pong message. Okay, um, so how can we rewrite that? Well, we can just look at an arbitrary uh, iteration of the loop and rewrite that, and that's just what we rewrote before. So we can generalize and uh, get the sequentialization of the whole program. Okay, so uh, here's a third example, and here um, the loop in P is split into two parts. So first, um, P sends out um, all the ping messages uh, to, to to the uh, sends out all the ping messages and then it receives all the replies. Okay, so can we rewrite that? Um, first, we focus on the first uh, loop, and then we can apply the same reasoning as before to sequentialize it into this loop, and then we end up with a partially sequentialized program um, that has a sequential prefix and a suffix that we still need to rewrite, and. Um, then here, uh, we can notice that uh, the, uh, all the, the processes are symmetric, and we can uh, apply the reasoning that I showed you before to rewrite it into the final version. So we evaluated our approach um, in a tool called Brisk. And so it, uh, it's implemented as a Haskell library and gives you communication primitives like uh, send, receive, and iteration over loops. And it either computes a canonical sequentialization or gives you a counterexample uh, to sequentialization, which consists of a prefix that it was able to synchronize, uh, sequentialize, and then a suffix um, that it was not. And this kind of helps you to find the um, errors that I showed you before. Um, so we've evaluated on it on a bunch of benchmarks. And uh, uh, so some of them are uh, tactical algorithms. And there's a map reduce framework and uh, a distributed file system. And what you can see is that uh, it's fast enough to be used in that interactive way that I showed you. And that actually, even though you have this restricted uh, computation model, you can still write quite a bundle, uh, bunch of algorithms in it. Okay. So to sum up, um, we, we um, made this observation that um, often you can reason about a representative uh, sequentialization of uh, a distributed program. Um, so the key idea is to uh, restrict races to races that produce equivalent outcomes. And if you have these two com uh, components, you can uh, verify programs uh, 
for deadlock freedom in uh, tens of milliseconds. Thanks.